Well, it's, it's great, great to be here uh, amongst uh, fellow believers, and uh, I appreciate very much the invitation from uh, Ralph Reed, who has uh, worked for uh, decades to try to bring some civil discourse and uh, some faith into our capital here. You know, I think that um, faith without freedom leads to intolerance and tyranny, and freedom without faith leads to neither one of them. You won't have anything if you do that. And, you know, the faith is a thing, I think, that really makes us concentrate on doing the right thing. But the faith is also the thing that gives us our freedom. And I think about, you know, my, my own career, I think back to a case uh, where a young man, a young man, four years old, was diagnosed with an inoperable malignant brain stem tumor. And uh, he ended up at Johns Hopkins, and you know, I looked at the studies and I said, this is inoperable. I agree with everybody else. Everybody else looked at it and agreed it was inoperable. But the faith of that family was just overwhelming. And they said, doctor, the Lord's going to heal our son, but he's going to use you to do it. And I said, yeah, right. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, they were so persistent, I finally agreed to do a biopsy and open them up, went it down. There was a horrible tumor, it came back, high-grade glioma. Closed them up, told them the bad news. I said, it is what everybody said it was. And, Unfortunately, there's nothing we're going to be able to do about that, but only God understands why a person is here and how long they need to be here, and we'll understand it better by and by, all the things we always tell people. And they said, Doctor, the Lord is going to heal our son. And I must admit, I'd never seen anybody who had that degree of faith, fully expecting him to deteriorate and die. He started getting better. His eyes, which had been looking in different directions, suddenly were looking at the same direction. He was able to handle his secretions. I said, let's do another scan. And there was still a big ugly tumor, but there was a little ribbon of tissue way up in the corner. And I said, maybe we should go back in and, and look. And we did and peel the tumor away layer by layer. When I got to the last layer under the microscope, there was the brainstem, smashed and displaced, but intact. Long story short, that little boy walked out of the hospital and today is a minister. But you know, but, but one of the oncologists who was involved in that case said to me, Ben, I've always been an atheist, but now I'm a believer. But it was really for me because see, I thought I was doing all this stuff. I thought I was this incredible surgeon who was doing all this great stuff. And, um, you know, I realized at that point that it was God. It was God all along. And I just said, Lord, you be the neurosurgeon and I'll be the hands. And that's where the gifted hands came from, because it was a gift from him. And, and that gave me the freedom to take on all kinds of cases. I wouldn't have had that freedom without the faith that he gave me through that particular endeavor. That's the thing that makes a difference, but I would have never thought that I would end up in government. That's the last place where <laughs> I would have thought. You tell me that, I would have told you we're nuts. But uh, of course, you know, the, the, the Lord guides in different ways. And you know, when I was asked to to be the keynote speaker for the National Prayer Breakfast in 2013. I thought that was kind of strange because I had been asked to do it in 1997 and I wasn't sure that anybody ever did it twice. Then I found out there was one person who did it twice and that was Billy Graham. And I said, well, that's, that's pretty good company. So, you know, I, I decided to do it. I didn't know what I was going to say until the day of the speech, but Obviously, it resonated with so many people, and after you do that, after that, everybody was saying, you should run for president. And I said, come on, give me a break. I said, you know, I said, if I just ignore it, it'll go away. Uh, 
But every place I went, there were people with signs, run, Ben, run, and it just kept mounting. And uh, I said, Lord, this is ridiculous. I said, uh, I said, how can I run for president? I don't have all the things that people who run for president have, a Rolodex with all the connections and, and all the money and all. I said, you can't run for president just out of the blue. I said, if you want me to really run for president, you need to supply all those things. Next thing I knew, I had an organization. We had so much money. We were make, pull, pulling in more money than the RNC. I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> and, and when I finally dropped out and uh, endorsed uh, Donald Trump, um, you know, I had to beg people to stop sending money. That was never, it was never an issue. But it turned out that I ended up where I believed the Lord wanted me. Because when, and when I was a neurosurgeon, I was also on the board of uh, Kellogg for 18 years, Costco for 16 years, and uh, had a lot of other experiences that I used to question. I said, Lord, neurosurgeons don't do this kind of stuff. Why, why am I doing this? But then I understood fully ending up head of a large government agency because you need all of those skills in terms of management of people, in terms of understanding financials and things of that nature. And the Lord never asks you to do anything that he doesn't prepare you for and that he doesn't give you the resources for to do. And, you know, at HUD, you know, these days we get accused of many things, subject of fake stories, written in such a way that the venom is dripping off the pages. There's so much hate out there. But I actually find a lot of this stuff quite amusing. I mean, like this furniture stuff. I mean, there is probably no one on earth who cares less about furniture than I do. <laughs> and, and probably no one who's more thrifty than my wife, but you know, they needed that narrative, just a bunch of craziness. But you know, the, but the people in this room really should play no part and getting caught up in all the partisan hatred. You know, somebody has to be the adult. And, uh, you know, I think that probably should be the Christians out there. And I'll tell you where I'm coming from. You know, I'm thinking about all of those individuals and the many families out there that are struggling. And, and we must be able to look at them in a compassionate and yet very responsible way. You know, I've been traveling around the country listening to lots of different groups. And in one group, a young lady stood up. She was very angry that it had taken the housing authority so long to find her a five-bedroom apartment because wow. she had all these children. And uh, she was even more angry because the dining room set had a scratch on the table. But, you know, as I was thinking about that, I said, you know, this young woman probably has never known any other life. Her mother probably lived here, and her grandmother probably lived here, and she doesn't even understand what is out there and what the American dream is all about. And that's one of the reasons that you'll see from the new HUD such an emphasis on self-sufficiency. Because, you know, I think, I think that is real compassion, is getting people out of poverty helping them to find the pathway. And it's a double win, because for each person you get out of that dependent situation, it's one less person you have to pay for, and it's one more taxpaying contributing member of society. So this is the way that we have to begin to think about these things. And you know, that's, that's the reason you know, we're now engaging in the discussions about rent reform and uh, putting in some policies that actually work. You know, for instance, uh, instead of assessing a person's income annually, assessing it every three years. 
because their rent, when you're in government assistance, is based on the amount of money you make. And the system now has all these perverse incentives on in it. So if you're, offered, you're working a job and you're offered a raise, you may well not take it because now your income goes up and your rent goes up. Uh, you, you certainly aren't going to want to get married to somebody who has an income because now your rent goes way up or you may lose your apartment altogether. And all these kinds of perverse incentives we built into the system. And I actually believe that a lot of people who are stagnant in these systems, if we create the right environment, would be happy to get a job and to use the talent that God has given them. We have to provide that opportunity for them. And that's one of the reasons that uh, we've come up with the Envision Center concept. Uh, if you looked at the news yesterday, you probably saw we were in Detroit opening the very first Envision Centers. Where did that come from? From the Bible. There is a verse in Proverbs 29, 18, without a vision, the people perish. There are a lot of people out there perishing. At first we called it vision centers, but we figured everybody would think they were going to get glasses, so now we <laughs> changed it to envision centers. But you know, they're, they're a place that, that brings the need in juxtaposition with the resources. We have a lot of resources in our country, and we have a lot of generous, compassionate people who would love to help, but we don't have a good mechanism for marrying those two things. And now we do, and that's, that's what the whole process is all about. We're already beginning to see uh, results from it, but we're gonna be measuring the metrics very carefully, because I do believe in data and in doing things uh, based upon things that we know that actually work. And uh, also, one of the things, one of the other things that I have seen that really works around the country are public-private partnerships. See, the government itself doesn't have enough money to do everything that needs to be done, but the private sector does. And uh, it was never the government's job to do a lot of the things that we're doing now. But uh, when the government acts in conjunction with the private sector, it's amazing what can be done. And you look how responsive the economy is uh, to correct uh, philosophies. There are those who say that the economy is naturally cyclical, goes up and down, up and down, that's just the way it works. I don't believe that. I believe that, that what is cyclical is the kind of leadership we have. Do we have people who understand how the economy works and then we have people who don't understand how it works? <laughs> That's why it goes up and down like that. And, you know, right now, right now we have people who do understand how it works. And uh, you look at some of the opportunities that that presents for us, like with the new tax uh, cut plan and jobs plan, opportunity zones are now going to be created where investments will be able to go into some of the economically deprived areas. And when we combine those with the RAD program and the low income housing tax credits and uh, with other uh, aspects of the private sector, we can now begin to build the right kinds of communities. You look at a place like the East Lake community in Atlanta, worse crime, uh, worse poverty, schools achieving at the lowest levels, and through public-private partnerships, a completely redone uh, neighborhood, including two charter schools that are now achieving at the highest levels in the state, better than the private schools, um, a flourishing community with all the things that you need uh, for completeness. Those are the kinds of things that we now have the opportunity to do. And I think you're going to see a lot of it being done over the next few years. And isn't that what it's all about? And that's what can happen when we, the American people, are willing to work together, when we don't allow ourselves to be manipulated and uh, told that we're enemies. We're not enemies. The people who are enemies are the ones who are trying to divide us and manipulate us. We're called the United States of America for a reason. And one of the reasons that we accelerated so quickly to the pinnacle of the world 
is because we were people who had faith. We were people who had beliefs and principles. And uh, godly principles are in no way antithetical to government. You know, you look at... Um, you, you look at our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, it talks about certain unalienable rights given to us by our Creator, a.k.a. God. The Pledge of Allegiance to our flag says we are one nation under God. Many courtrooms on the wall, it says, in God we trust. Every coin in your pocket, every bill in your wall, it says, in God we trust. So if it's in our founding documents, it's in our pledge, it's in our courts, and it's on our money, but we're not supposed to talk about it. What in the world is that? In medicine, it's called schizophrenia. And we need, we need to make sure that everyone knows that it's okay to live by godly principles of loving your fellow man, caring about your neighbor, developing your God-given talents to the utmost so that you become valuable to the people around you, having values and principles that govern your life. And if we do that, not only will we make America great again, but we will have one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. <laughs>